Hello and welcome to Insight with Beyond the Headlines and Political Tours. Iceland has been praised for clamping down early on COVID-19. Its latest figures show barely a dozen cases of confirmed infections. As a result, and with careful testing on arrival, it's now gradually opening up its economy to tourists. Are there lessons to be learned here, or is Iceland just too small for a fair comparison? Joining us, we have Dr. Kari Stefansson, the founder of Decode, which mapped the country's genome and is now helping to test and track the movement of COVID-19. Hello, Dr. Stefansson, where are you at the moment? I am at our Decode headquarters in the middle of Rage Week. In a, in a nice boardroom, we can see. It's a boardroom of sorts. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we also have Thordo Juliusson, the founder and editor of Kianin, a digital media company that focuses on in-depth reporting. Um, thanks very much indeed for joining us, Thordo. Whereabouts are you? I'm in Reykjavik as well, about the five minute drive away from Kauri. Okay, excellent. If you've got questions, everyone, please do put them in the Q&A box below. And also please stay on at the end of the hour when we have our own discussion. Just type in the questions as we go and we'll take those questions a bit later on and then we'll turn your microphone on. If you want to turn your camera on, you can as well. Um, Kari, if I can turn to you first, if we go back to February, which is when I think Europe was more aware of what was going on in China and March, when in your view did Iceland see COVID-19 as a real threat? When did the government begin to take it seriously? The public health officials in Iceland started to uh, monitor uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the middle of January. And actually they started to test people as early as the 31st of January. The first case was diagnosed on February 28th after, after the authorities had been screening people for a, a whole month. And in the beginning, they were mainly screening people coming from the ski slopes of Austria and Italy. And they were screening people who were symptomatic eh, or, or had signs and symptoms of cold and, and sore throat. And, and it wasn't until about March the 5th that the, we at ECO decided to begin to screen the population in general. And the reason we started to do that is that I was listening to the radio in my car on the way to work when they were talking about the epidemic in China and they were talking about the death rate from the infection. And they concluded that the death rate was about 3.4%. That 3.4% of those infected would die. And I couldn't understand how they could calculate out the death rate without knowing the distribution of the virus in the community. So I proposed that we should begin to screen the Icelandic population in general and, and the public health authorities uh, welcomed that with open arms. So basically we started to offer a volunteers, anyone who wanted to be tested could come and get tested for free. Then we started to call in a random sample of the population. And, and in the end, we did a, a sort of a screening of people from around the, the whole country. And, and it was extraordinarily important to know the distribution of the virus in the community, because otherwise you are poking in the dark. So the, the authorities in Iceland, on the basis of the screening, on one hand screening by the healthcare system, or those symptomatic, and then the population screening that they did, they in, in implemented the following measures to contain the, uh, the spread of the infection. Uh, they put the, the infected in isolation. They had an extraordinarily good team tracking the contacts of the infected, and the contacts were put in quarantine. We kept our elementary schools open, we kept our childcare centers open, we kept the stores open, we closed the movie theater, the concert halls, and we put a ban on the assembly of more than 22 individuals. We kept the borders really open and, and with no less, you know, with, with, with the measures that were no more draconic than this, we managed basically to clamp down on, on the infection very quickly. And it is interesting, if you look at the molecular characteristics of, their, of the epidemic, and we can look at them today, that basically 
the day after these measures were implemented, we began to see uh, signs of decline of the spread of the epidemic. So these measures were sufficient and they were effective and the, the effect of them set, did set in immediately once they were implemented. So j just, um, it, it gives me the impression of a very efficient operation, but the thing that people are going to say straight off is that Iceland has got a tiny population. I've heard people talk about population density being one of the, the lowest in Europe. Uh, although I know you've argued about Reykjavik being a, a, a small size like a, a US town, um, w w it, it would seem to me that you've got geography and population in, in, on your side, but is, you, you think that both the UK and the US could have done a similar thing? The population of Iceland is rather small, but our resources are also very small. And the only thing you need to do to implement these methods was have the resources to screen, have the resources to track the contacts of the infected. And there's not a shadow of a doubt in my mind that you could have done, done the same both in the US and the United Kingdom. The, the one quality of the population, the quality of the population that worked with us was not the small size of the population, but the fact of the matter that people did abide by the instructions that were handed out by the public health authorities. It was very rare that people did violate the quarantine or the isolation. There's another thing that you see in the, in sort of in the middle of the epidemic, middle of this phase of the epidemic in Iceland, we started to use a, an app on, on smartphones to track the contacts basically putting in an app that allowed you to find all of the cellular phones that have been within a certain distance of the cellular phone of the infected within the past five days. This was, a, this was an app that was downloaded voluntarily, so it wasn't imposed on people, but it's a bit of a violation of privacy, but in sort of all hands on deck kind of a moment, it was considered justified. Apps like that would have been particularly effective in heavily populated areas. But, but the thing that sort of surprises me the most is that if you take the Great Britain and you take the United States, where all of the methods that we use to contain this infection were discovered, you know, what we learned from your Brits and Americans are the things that we use to contain the infection in, a, in our country. And, 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 and it's interesting that, you know, one of the reasons that we were able to contribute. And in the end, we became a necessary component of this in Iceland, because when there were instrument failures in the laboratory at the National Hospital, we took on all of the diagnosis. And, and one of the reasons we could do that is that the authorities allow themselves the flexibility of letting us, who are basically a, a science operation, to become a testing lab. In the United States, it was difficult, the FDA didn't, had relatively strict rules as to who was allowed to do testing, etc. And my guess is that the same applies to Great Britain. But the United States and Great Britain have probably 23 of the 25 best universities in the world. They have incredible intellectual resources, technical resources, mm. and the ability to, to screen in a population like yours. You know, people who could have organized it, interpreted the data, implemented these measures, but none of it was done. Yeah. So and, just, just to round up on the last thing, so what were, in March, what were the numbers of testing that you were doing in sort of late March? How many, how many a day were you doing by then, late March? We were probably doing two, three thousand a day. <clears throat> and, and, you know, if you would translate that into the United States, they would have had to do, uh, you know, about two, three million a day. All right, it's thousand times larger population, and they have never ever done screening like that in, in the United States. Yes. Okay, but we did more than just screen. What is important here is that we sequence the virus from every infected person, and the reason that is important is that even though the mutation rate in the virus is relatively low, it has infected so many individuals, you know, 10, 11 million people today that it has had an incredible opportunity to mutate.
Yeah. And when the virus moves into a new geographic area, it continues to mutate uh, relatively randomly. So it gathers a collection of mutations that become characteristic for a particular region. So, so we could basically determine where from the virus had come into every infected Icelanders. And in the beginning, the authorities were focusing on people coming from Austria and Italy. But once we started to screen and sequence, we could show that as the authorities were focusing on these high risk areas, this virus was sneaking into Iceland from many other countries. Mm. For example, there is our... We'll come back to you in a second about the, the testing and what you've learned, because I know you've been doing a lot of very valuable research on that, particularly about the mutations and what that says about the virus. I'd like to come back to you in a second on that. But Thorda, just to come back to you, um, was there any reluctance to start with um, um, from the, the government to introduce these measures? And then also, are we being unfair? I mean, Iceland clearly has massive advantages in terms of geography, small size of population, and also in terms of communication, surely. Um, are we being unfair to Great Britain and the United uh, States? No, we aren't. Uh, uh, but uh, these, are, these are countries with incredible resources, yeah. both financial and intellectual. And it is completely unacceptable how, how, how they responded to the epidemic. There is no reason for them, you're not, you know, if, you know there, there, are, there are different reasons. If, if you look at the United States, you know, where, where the problem in many ways starts at the top, all right? Where you have a president who is very reluctant to admit in the beginning that this is going to be a problem and, and it makes all kinds of decisions that, are, are, that make it difficult to respond in a federal way to the, to the threat in the United States. So there, there are all kinds of political reasons. And, and, and one thing that I believe is particularly important here, that the government of Iceland had, you could say that it had the wisdom, but I would say that they had. Oh, we've, lo we've lost your, I seem to have lost your sound there. Um, a bit, Kari. So I'll, we'll just see if we can come back to that in a second. Thordor, just to, I, I mean, personally speaking, I mean, I sympathise with, with um, well, I would agree with what Kari has just been saying, but there are mitigating circumstances for um, someone like the, the UK that has you know, clearly got massive amounts of people travelling into it and um, uh, greater population density, surely? Uh, yes, just to come back to your earlier question first, uh, I mean, what the politicians, in plain words, in Iceland did very well was just to get out of the way. Uh, the government handed over the reins of this epidemic to the public health officials, uh, and we formed uh, the so-called Troika, which was uh, put together by the head of the Directorate of Health, uh, State Police Civil Protection Chief, and the Chief Epidemi Epidemiologist. And uh, they started uh, having these daily briefings uh, informing the nation about where the epidemic was, uh, what sort of measures were in place, and uh, explaining to people uh, how they should react and uh, why they should do what the authorities were telling them to do. This was very successful. The Troika had a lot of credibility, which was not something that uh, was very that not something you could foresee because uh, there has been a lot of distrust towards institutions, especially politics in Iceland in the last decade. Uh, so uh, the best thing that the politicians did here was just to stay out of the way. That said, it, it was by no means uh, the only way that was being presented when at the start of, of the epidemic, uh, the way that the public health officials wanted to go. There were other voices and, and critics that said uh, we should uh, take more drastic and even draconian measures to um, limit our way of life to uh, get control on the epidemic. And others that had the alternative view that this was uh, these were invasions of freedom that were unacceptable. But uh, the mass majority of Icelanders uh, have, like Kauri pointed out earlier, uh, complied with these measures that were put in place. 
uh, Iceland has not closed down its uh, society in the same manner than many, that many other countries did. We have kept our schools open the whole way through. We have had some sort of sense of normality that many other societies have lacked over uh, our handling of the epidemic. And uh, now since early May, we basically have uh, gone back to life as it was before, uh, minus you know, international travel. So, and minus obviously the amount of tourists that used to come here uh, over the summertime. So, uh, yes, uh, I think uh, that if you, another thing that Kaori touched upon as well is that uh, the public private partnership that we were able to strike up in a matter of hours or days between uh, Decode, which fortunately is situated in Iceland, uh, and uh, the public health officials to expand our screening and testing and and, and sequencing uh, was clearly instrumental uh, in us getting uh, on handling the epidemic in the way that we were able to do uh, at a very crucial period. And the the, um, the, the, the I think I guess the. In, in terms of comparing the size of Iceland and the size of the UK, if you think of the number of people traveling into the UK, the, the, also, I guess, the size of the economy. I'm just trying to give um, the politicians some leeway in um, seeing the threat and balancing it with um, the, the enormous measures they would have to shut down the fifth largest economy in the world. I mean, as Kauri pointed out, uh, we didn't basically shut down our borders, but they were shut down for us, uh, most of our uh, most important marketing uh, business countries, uh, they shut down their borders. The U.S. in the mid of March, and then uh, you know the European countries that uh, uh, we do the most business with in the days after that. So uh, our biggest uh, pillar under our economy in the last few years has been tourism. Uh, we are facing. Uh, uh, a decline in our GDP in this year, in this fiscal year, is is, is minus 8.4 percent. Uh, that's huge for a country like ours. Uh, we basically are uh, shutting down the biggest pillar under our economy in the measures that we have taken. Uh, I realize that uh, that the combination of of different sectors that make up the economies of countries like the UK and and, and obviously the US uh, is very different from the Icelandic one. But the effects uh, on Iceland on the Icelandic economy that this epidemic is having is vast, and uh, at it's 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 a larger uh, percentage uh, effect than it has, for instance. Uh, on the US, U.S. economy, and very similar to the one that is expected to have on the U.K. economy. And it's worth bearing in mind that, I mean, Iceland had heavily invent, invested in the banking sector and was hit very hard um, in the financial crisis, and this had been a shift away from that. The, the shift to tourism was partly in consequence to the last crisis. Yeah, I mean, we we were hit very hard. We were had... Uh, uh, our currency plummeted, we had vast unemployment, we had uh, a huge debt problem here in Iceland, both uh, our treasury and our households after the bank crash of 2008. We had to put, up, uh, put in place capital controls to control the flow of money in and out of the Icelandic economy uh, via the central bank, and those were up until early 2017. And basically, there were two major uh, things that... Um, uh, sort of gave our economy a boost again. For the first thing was macro fishing, uh, which became very important in the years after the banking crash. And the second one was tourism. We had a rise in tourism here in Iceland. In, well, in 2010, we had 500,000 people visiting Iceland. In 2018, we had 2.3 million. So tourism became went from being... Uh, uh, a small part of uh, the Icelandic economy to be its biggest and most important pillar. Uh, it was bringing in uh, the, the biggest chunk of imports and it was employing the most vast amount of people. 
so uh, when that evaporates in just a matter of weeks, uh, we go from uh, having, you know, as I said, over 2 million tourists to, well, since mid-March, <clears throat> practically no one. Uh, that's going to have huge economic effects. Yeah. Uh, just to go back a bit, there was some reluctance, wasn't I, I know that um, Kari was quite, we seem to have had a problem um, first with the sound, uh, and then I think we've lost the line, and we're trying to get the line back up again with Kari, so my fingers crossed on that, somebody's working on that at the moment. Um, there was a problem, wasn't there? I mean, um, Kari was quite strong in trying to push the government to, to take measures. There's some, there was some hesitancy to start with. Well, I wouldn't say there was a lot of hesitancy inside the government, at least not officially. Uh, understandably, uh, there's no blueprint for something like this. So, uh, but when measures were taken, they were taken quite swiftly and drastically. And as I said earlier, uh, the best decision that our politicians, especially our government did, was uh, just to stay out of the way just to let the public health officials both uh, map out what we needed to do and to be the face of the response, to have these daily briefings, which were, you know, had ratings that Trump would be proud of uh, because there was such an amount of the, uh, so such a larger percentage of, of, uh, of the country that was watching them. And, uh, and, as Kauri pointed out as well, there was this sort of togetherness and people uh, complied to the measures that were put in place. That is something that uh, is maybe a little bit difficult to explain. Maybe it is because we are a very small country. Uh, you either know someone or you know somebody that knows them. Uh, and uh, we uh, sort of took it on as a challenge uh, that everybody was... Uh, a part of to just stick it out for a few weeks or months uh, and uh, so we could reclaim the normality of our being and uh, we did that and uh, for the last almost two months uh, Iceland has in many ways you know although there are still some measures in place been like it's uh, you know uh, like it is used to be I mean the measures that are still in place is that uh, there's still a cap on how many people can uh, come together, so there's no concerts or anything like that. Uh, the bars are only open until 11, mm. but uh, that's something that people can live with. Uh, and, uh, yeah. And j just, to, I think it's worth, um, particularly if you're in the US or UK, it's worth um, outlining the measures that you are taking. So, um the economy is, I mean, the tourism is being allowed, you know, to start back up again. So if, you, if you're from the UK, you could theoretically fly to Iceland and, and go on holiday. But the, just describe some of the measures in place. If I go to Iceland, there's a lot that's going to reassure the Icelandic population that I don't have COVID. Yeah, so uh, if you uh, fly into Iceland since the mid of, uh, middle of June, you, you have to be screened at the airport uh, for COVID-19. Uh, you have to pay for that screening. Uh, and uh, uh, when you, uh, if you are asymptomatic, uh, you have to quarantine for two weeks. Uh, if uh, you have to download the app so that uh, uh, Icelandic public health officials can know where you are if, uh, if you get infected and who you've been in contact to. So there are quite strict measures and uh, even though we have um, as you have we have to point out again we have never really had our borders closed there were other borders that were closed that made it you know impossible for tourists to come here but we have put in place these measures to uh, make it a, make it possible for people to come to Iceland without quarantining for two weeks so those are the most stringent measures that are in place for tourists. Uh, for, our, for us, uh, the locals, there aren't many, uh, to, 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 to be quite honest. Uh, there are some um, you know, caps, as I said earlier, on how many people can come together. 
There were expectations that we could move that cap up to up to 2,000 in early July, but uh, public health officials walked that back yesterday. So, uh, uh, but you can go to restaurants, you can go uh, go to the bar until 11, and uh, schools have been open the whole time. Uh, society is a lot like it used to be, you know, without the 2.3 million tourists that we are very accustomed to having you know, around, especially at this time, because we're approaching uh, uh, sort of the peak of the tourism uh, season here in Iceland. Okay. Now, I'd love to get people's questions, so please do um, put your start. If you see the Q&A bubble at the bottom of the screen, just do start um, typing your questions in there, everyone, and we can take them. Um, somebody is trying to get Kari Stephenson back up again. Uh, I don't know what's happened there. Hopefully, we'll get we'll get him back up. Um, the, just just picking up on the track and trace, you had um, teams of um, police detectives tracking early cases. Um, I think there seems to be a general agreement in the UK that it's community testing. You need community tracing. Um, there's a set, there's a, a private company that's been employed to track down people who've t um, the contacts of people who've tested positive, but it's the traditional community tracing that was in the hands of the county councils that is seen as, as more effective. Can you just describe what Iceland did early on with those teams? Well, they put together teams uh, uh, that the, the different public officials, you know, we had policemen, we had detectives, we had people from uh, public health uh, industry uh, put together and basically uh, mapping out uh, everybody that uh, somebody that had been diagnosed as infected had been in contact with uh, in the in the days uh, before that he could have infected himself. So those people were all quarantined and uh, then tested and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So uh, that, that proved hugely effective. Uh, so uh, the track and trace path that Iceland took both by doing all these, uh, you know, do, 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 doing all these tests. I mean, we have, what, 65,000 tests that we've done uh, inside Iceland, 14,000 tests on our borders, uh, and all the tracking that we did. The app obviously helped a lot. Uh, these things combined with the togetherness that I spoke about earlier uh, and everybody following the measures that were put in place, uh, I, I would say those things combined are the reason that we did as well as we did. The the, I'd like to shift to politics now. Um, there's a huge sense, I think, um, in the US um, and definitely the UK and th across Europe that politics as we know it is going to change as a result of what's happening here, partly because of the enormous economic consequences um, of, of the virus. Um, Iceland had its... An enormous financial crisis back in between 2008, 2009, and, and earlier, uh, and that had its own colossal political consequences in Ireland, in Iceland. Can you just talk briefly about that? And also, is there a sense that you see things shifting here? I think this is interesting because you are it's because you're such a small place. It's quite easy for you to understand what's going on. You can get a better, a quicker grip of things than perhaps we can. So. Uh... For decades before the uh, for, for before the bank crash in two thousand eight, we had a very uh, very well rooted political system here in Iceland. We could call it the four plus one system. We had four major parties. That was basically a, a left wing socialist party, a social democratic party, a farmers party, and then sort of a, a right to the middle independence party, which was usually in uh, in government. And then we had the plus one party, which came and went and was sort of the flavor of uh, the month in each period. Uh, you know, we had a women's party in the 80s. We had sort of a, a more liberal party in the 90s, etc. cetera. Uh, after the crash, that whole political system collapsed. Uh, first, we had five parties, then we had six. And then in 2016, uh, in the elections, then we had seven and uh, 2017 when we had our second general election in one year we had eight uh, in the municipality elections here in Reykjavik 2018 we had eight again uh, elected to the municipality uh, 
so uh, this is uh, a consequence of uh, Icelanders starting well, trust from Icelanders towards our major institutions, especially pol political institutions, uh, the Althingi, uh, the municipality governments, etc. Uh, it just evaporated after the bank crash. Uh, went under 20% and is still around 20%. Had been well over 40% before the bank crash. So uh, this is the situation we now are facing after some very good years. I mean, economically, we've had uh, a huge boom uh, due to the tourism industry, due to how we were able to uh, basically get out of paying uh, a lot of money to uh, to hedge funds that had bought credit, uh, had bought bonds on, on uh, the failed Icelandic banks. Uh, with a deal struck in 2015 and 16, uh, we were in a very healthy situation. Our debt levels have gone down extremely. Uh, we have had uh, vast growth year on year since 2012, and uh, even had we we had a, a mild growth last year, and now we're facing uh, an 8.4 percent. Uh, um, minus 8.4 percent uh, change in our GDP this year, so we're experiencing our second huge uh, downturn in you know, a little over a decade. Uh, this one is deeper than the last one was. This one is, uh, as the estimate goes, the deepest one we have experienced since we uh, became independent in 1944. And uh, the long-term forecasts aren't that positive either. We're uh, seeing, uh, especially unemployment rates, uh, being expected to be uh, well over 8% this year and uh, between 6 and 7% next year and in 2022. And uh, all three years, if, if that would be uh, the result, uh, all three years would rank amongst probably the top 10 uh, years in the history of independent Iceland that we have had the most unemployment. So uh, again, we're faced with a crisis. This one can't really be blamed on the government. Uh, you know, this is uh, this was a health crisis. And uh, I think there is a common consensus that uh, the pol politicians took the right decisions by uh, implementing the measures that they did. Uh, they have also uh, implemented vast amounts of economic uh, decisions, mm -hmm. uh, furlough schemes, uh, vast grant schemes to companies, especially in tourism, to try to help them get through all this. And uh, those aren't played out in full yet. So we don't really, uh, we can't really say as of today, if they have worked in a manner that is going to be uh, positive for Iceland society and the Icelandic economy as we are. Uh, we really need to see how things pan out in the fall and maybe early next year to, uh, to get a greater scope on that. But we have a general election next year, so uh, there is a lot of political turmoil, obviously, uh, related to the economic effects of the pandemic. I think one one thing was interesting was I was going to ask Kari was about expenditure on healthcare and hospitals, and he can you talk a bit about the measures that he was pushing for well before this crisis because I think that's very interesting. There's a huge amount of demand now in the UK for for more uh, expenditure on the health service. Well, he he, he uh, pushed. Uh an agenda a few years back trying to get Icelanders to undersign that uh, uh, the government would spend more money on basically the healthcare system. Uh, he wanted the percentage of uh, the government spending that we spend on healthcare to go up. And uh, he ended up getting, if I remember it correctly, almost 87,000 people uh, to to sign his petition, uh, which is the largest petition uh, that has ever been conducted here in Iceland. And uh, uh, although uh, the government did not meet Kauri's criteria, 
or hasn't done that yet, uh, it was obviously very effective to put uh, government spending on healthcare uh, in the limelight and, uh, and or in the spotlight, and uh, and it has been going up quite vastly in the last few years. And do you see any major sort of political shifts or demands then coming out of this? I mean, you say the the key difference is that you've got a population that thinks the government has handled the crisis very well, um, which isn't the case here if you look at the opinion polls. But there are there any? Can you see see any shifts or developments coming out of this? Well, as I said, I think what the government has done very well, and I think is the, sort of the public perception, is that they stayed out of the way uh, and they let the specialists uh, do the blueprint and, and execute the measures. Uh, I think the government is going to be judged much more on the economic fallout that we are experiencing than uh, how they handled uh, the healthcare crisis because we handle that very well. And uh, we have to remember, it is the job of governments to do things well. Uh, so uh, I think uh, at least recent polling uh, is showing that uh, support for the government is uh, back uh, after a small spike, you know, sort of a rally around the flag, flag spike that we had in, in March and in, in early April. Uh, we're seeing support for the government uh, falling again and, and support for the, for, for the three parties that form the coalition government here in Iceland uh, falling as well. And I think that is uh, related to uh, mostly uh, the economic measures that uh, they have introduced. And... Uh, so we'll see. Uh, we'll have an ultimate polling on it last next year when we'll have a general election. Uh, but as it stands, the government does not have a majority and could not carry on after a general election if it was held today. Right. Um, I do need everyone's questions. We are struggling to get hold of Kari Stephenson back. Um, so we're going to go move to Q&A now. So please do start writing your questions um, in the box there, and then Isabel will be able to to pull up you, pull you up so you can speak to us directly. Um, it is just just um, going back a bit. Can you tell us? I, I wanted to um, focus a bit more of, on the more radical um, political movements that came out after the financial crisis. Um, you took a much tougher line on the banking sector, I think, than the, both the US or the UK did. Um, and that, that, that sort of stood in contrast of what we were doing. So just talk a bit about that, if you can. Um, and I think, I think that might give us some indication of what, of um, the, the kind of alternative politics that we might see coming out of this. I mean, you also, you, you have to put in perspective that our banking system was basically at 1.12 times our GDP. So uh, when our uh, banks, uh, all the three largest banks all fell in the space of what five days uh, that had huge consequences on the whole of Icelandic society and we obviously demanded answers because the Icelandic public had to uh, take this on had to shoulder the burden of these consequences so uh, what we did was that we put up a, a special prosecutor's office to investigate we also put up a parliamentary committee uh, that uh, released a report uh, in April 2010 on uh, the whole uh, on, on the whole crash and what led up to it, which was many thousand pages long, and everything was revealed. Everybody was named. Uh, the people that got loans that were thought to be skeptical, uh, most of the possible crimes committed, everything was explained and put forward in that report. That report is. Uh, still available today online and was sold in bookstores and became a bestseller here in Iceland. So we did things in a much different way than many other countries did. Um, in the aftermath of the release of the report, the Special Prosecutor's Office started uh, arresting and then uh, uh, and then uh, taking all these bankers to court, which eventually ended up a lot of them ended up getting very hard prison sentences for economic crimes, mostly market manipulation and fraud. Uh, so we have, yes, jailed uh, a lot of bankers, and we've done things uh, quite differently than other uh, 
the other countries did by uh, not holding back on revealing what happened. Uh, but the reason for us to do that was, as I explained earlier, that uh, the effects that uh, the fall of the banks had on the whole society were so vast. Okay, we've got some good good questions coming through here now. Um, Marty Ryan is up there. Marty, do you want to ask your question? Your your microphone should be fine now. Go ahead. Yes. Hi. Thanks. Um, since the United States has done such a poor job in containing the virus, and there are some countries who are not wanting U.S. tourists to arrive, would Iceland exclude U.S. tourists? As of now, we are, you know, we are basically excluding U.S. tourists uh, as long as they are not allowed to come into Schengen. But there are exemptions. Uh, for instance, Icelanders that are in, in in the U.S. can come in and take tests. But I, th I think I think it's still uh, uh, the rule that we have in place as of now is that you have to quarantine if you come from the U.S. Uh, if you're a journalist, so the New Yorker, there was a, a report of the New Yorker who read that um, Iceland had stopped um, Americans from traveling to Iceland. And she thought, uh, oh, um, I could go there as a journalist and um, sent, sent her uh, emails off to the government and it took her a while to get in. So Marty, maybe that's the solution. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we have, a, you know, we had a couple of infections, uh, well, a few, a few infections detected in the last few days, and they are coming from the U.S. because we had a young, uh, a young lady, a football player that was a university student in the U.S., an Icelandic citizen that came back home to to play soccer for her team in the summer, and uh, she proved asymptomatic uh, at the border, but then a few days later took another test and was positive. So uh, uh, as a result of that, we now have over 400 people in quarantine. So it, it happens quite quite quickly if, if, if somebody that is infected uh, comes into the country. Uh, I think uh, with the situation in the US as it is, uh, I think it's going to be you know, at least a while until uh, Iceland and Europe as a whole will uh, will uh, look at uh, opening up fully to the US. I mean, I think that goes without saying. Okay, we've got some more questions coming through. Um, Thank you. Just, just briefly, thought is your your sense of are we at the beginning of this? Where where, where does where do the Icelandic authorities think we are in this crisis? And time wise, time wise. I mean, that's a question that would have suited Kauri much better than me. Uh, I'm not uh, an expert in this. Uh, I mean, I, I think everybody's learning as we go along. Uh, as I said uh, earlier, there is no blueprint on how to handle these things. Uh, we, uh, at the end, turned out to have done things in a very good manner. I think this is a common perspective here in Iceland. Uh, if if uh, the measures that we have put in place are enough to uh, to shield us from another spike, that's something that needs to uh, just we need just to wait and see. Um, I I don't have the uh, know-how or experience to to answer that in any other way. Yeah, um, I've got another question here. Is why do you think um, Iceland? has less coverage than New Zealand in the UK? Uh, I don't know, uh, better PR people in New Zealand? Uh, uh, I can't ask that. But there, has been, there has been quite a bit of focus on Iceland's success. I mean, there have been quite a few US networks, I think, who've, who've been looking at quite a few, sort of, um, d definitely Kari has been popping up on um, networks with the, the success of their operation. Yes, and I mean, as it was uh, the last time that we had a, an economic hole to fill, uh, uh, disasters t uh, sometimes uh, tend to uh, turn out something positive for us. Then we had obviously the banking crash and all the jailed bankers, and we were on the news all over the all over the world because of them. And then we had the Eyjafjallajökull eruption in 2010, which stopped all flight traffic in Europe. Uh, and uh, the Icelandic government at the time thought it was a disaster, but turned out to be the best PR we had ever had because we were on the news 
all around the world and every uh, every news story started with a drone shot of fantastic Icelandic nature. Uh, so uh, it was PR that money couldn't buy. Uh, maybe Kauri and, uh, and uh, the other people that are talking about how we were able to handle this pandemic will have the same effects. Uh, it seems to be that Iceland is perceived quite positively as a place that is safe to come to. I think that's an accurate assumption. Uh, and uh, then we just have to see if the measures that we have in place are enough or if we need to tweak them to to keep uh, what is so attractive for people to come here, mm. which is uh, that safeness and then, uh, yeah. So that, that's something we're actually actively looking at. Um, so for people who do want to go to Iceland, um, you get a test, um, as Thorda was saying, um, you get a test that costs around 100 euros um, at the airport. You get the results for that test within 24 hours, sometimes sooner, and you're encouraged to stay in your hotel and not go anywhere in the meantime until you get the results that, that, that test. Um, and then you have a tracing app. You have to have an app on your phone. And that means that anybody traveling in twice and has got confidence that, um, uh, that they're not bringing an infection with them, but also they're traveling in a, a relatively in, infectious-free environment. So from our point of view, from doing our study tours, that's actually very useful. So Iceland is one of the first places we're looking at in, t in terms of opening up tours. But the, the loss, nevertheless, Thordor, to the um, economy, as you were saying, is colossal. And the government has shifted to try and encourage domestic tourism. How's that been going? And how, how, is there any sense of where this is going to go in sort of six months' time, a year's time? What else can be done? We've got more questions coming through. We will be taking more questions as well. Also, uh, it's going okay. I mean, the Icelanders are, uh, our private consumption is quite high. I mean, we are a rich nation. We, uh, the Icelandic public, like to travel. We uh, travel a lot abroad. Now, obviously, that is problematic. Uh, so uh, that incentive to travel a lot has been uh, sort of guided inbounds, and we're traveling a lot inside Iceland, which is something a lot of Icelanders have not done in the last few years, mainly because uh, it's difficult to experience our country as we did maybe when we were younger because of the amount of tourists. Now we can go to these uh, one-of-a-kind tourist attractions all over the country, and sometimes you're there alone. I mean, I went with my wife in May to Jökulsárlón, which is just behind, just below Vatnajökull, one of the largest glaciers in the world, one of the most extraordinary places in the world. I have not gone there for over a decade because every time I've driven, driven past there, there have been uh, bus by bus on the parking lot. It was just full of tourists. This time we were alone there for 45 minutes which was quite extraordinary and something that will never happen again, I think, in my lifetime, that you are able to go to a place like that and be alone there. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of uh, positives for Icelanders to also use the infrastructure that we have built mm. uh, to accommodate all these tourists that have been coming here in the last few years that we have not experienced until now. All yeah, these hotels yeah. that have been built all over the country, et cetera. But nevertheless, you know, very, very tough economic times to, to come. And as yet, no answer as to how to fill, fill that void, or at least to hope that tourism might get, get back up. Um, I mean, we're, the economic question is obviously something that uh, every country is going through. We are in a, an okay stead to deal with it because, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, relatively little government debt in a debt uh, that we have been able to pay down in the last few years. Uh, our household debt levels have uh, are at an okay level. Uh, I think uh, we will see come the fall how the situation is in the world. Uh, we can map out maybe a little bit better if and when the tourism industry can recover in such a way that they can at least contribute to filling the gap that we have um, in our uh, in our economy. But uh, if not, we just, like anybody else, need to find new ways. Mm. And we're productive people, we'll find ways. We've got a good question from Shirley Smith here. Shirley, if you just uh, check your... There we go, Shirley, go and ask your question, Shirley. 
Hi. Um, yeah, I was really interested in one of the things that kept coming up, which was the key to the success was partially or mainly that the government got out of the way um, and things like the public were able to hear directly from the scientific panel. Um, I was wondering whether one of the influential factors in that was that you had a coalition government and therefore the health crisis didn't become politicised in the way that it seems to have done in, for example, the UK and the US. Um, that's a good question. Uh, Maybe. Uh, so our coalition government is not only just a coalition government, it, it is a very strange coalition government. We have a government that is, uh, our prime minister is from the left Green Party, uh, and the two parties that are with them in the government are on one hand a very conservative farmers party and uh, a right to the centre, uh, the independence party. So we have a government that stretches from the left to the right. Uh, and uh, that has obviously uh, ideolo ideological uh, consequences. Uh, these parties have a very different worldview, uh, so they have to do a lot of compromises in the way that they govern. Uh, that maybe be maybe that is one of the reasons that uh, they decided to stay out of the way. I think. Uh, the main reason is that, uh, like Kauri pointed out before, uh, the public health officials, officials were starting to map out this epidemic here in Iceland in January. They had started their work on how to uh, face this epidemic if and when, uh, way before the government officials. So uh, I can imagine when... Uh, when the skiers from Austria and, and Italy brought the virus full blown over here to Iceland in late February, uh, the public health officials were uh, were quite advanced with their planning, uh, especially compared to the government. So uh, I think a lot of uh, I think the government to, to look at you just use your uh, you look at where the public health officials are with their planning and uh, you say, well, okay, I mean, they seem to have a path that we have to formulate if we want to counteract them. Okay. And uh, I think that was uh, a very good decision to to uh, put the trust on the public health officials and not try to, to create their own path and put themselves in the spotlight. Because it's I mean, it turned out both in the US and the UK especially to not out not to be a very good idea for prime ministers or 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 other ministers to to put themselves front and center in this crisis it's been uh counterproductive for them polling wise especially yeah i think it's also interesting to, to um i was thinking about the example with austria when you talked about the um ski resort um and there are lots of um people there was a major cluster of infections in one ski resorts and didn't iceland actually raise that with austria at that at the time yes uh we did uh because it was quite apparent where uh the virus was coming from we uh icelanders uh, you probably would imagine that we have uh, vast ski resorts because we're quite cold that's not really the case. Icelandic skiers tend to go to other countries in Europe, especially in the Alps, uh, uh, in the winter months to 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 get high class skiing uh, resorts. And uh, there were groups coming home, both for both from Italy and uh, and Austria, that uh, were clearly carrying the virus and 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 bringing sort sort of the first wave of, of infections here in Iceland uh, late February and uh, the Icelandic government uh, directly uh, contacted the Austrian authorities and first uh, were met with huge skepticism and refusals. Obviously uh, these resorts did not want to to be known as the hotspots of, uh, of COVID-19 in Europe. Uh, and did not put in measures that would have been applicable to put in at that moment and probably uh, ended up uh, escalating the problem at those resorts uh, in a manner that would have not been necessary if they would have listened to the Icelandic public health officials. Mm. Well, when we've got a few more minutes left here, so please, if you've got any more questions, do, do get them in now. Um, 
I'm, I know you've followed events both in the UK and the US. What did you think when you saw Boris Johnson um, announcing that there would be a, a world-class um, track and trace system, a world-class, world-beating testing system? Um, and then uh, I think the, it was Matt Hancock's um, uh, hope to produce an app that still hasn't been put into effect yet. I mean... Uh... Uh, I have a lot of friends in the UK. I, I studied in the UK and lived in Scotland for a few years. Uh, and uh, it's quite easy for me to uh, speak to them and we sort of can and me measure the way that our life has, is at each and every given point uh, due to the measures intact in each country. And uh, I think uh, it's quite clear that... Uh, the way that the UK government handled this is not world class. It had huge uh, consequences. It had a death toll that is higher than it maybe had to be. It had infections that are uh, more vast than they had to be. It, ha it will have huge economic consequences, probably the largest consequences of all the European, well, at least the Western Hemisphere European countries. So, uh, I think uh, history will deem those uh, those words in uh, quite a negative manner. Yeah. If anyone's got any view that's different to that, please do you know, chip in. Um, there might be some who's saying, look, you know, the UK was dealt with a very difficult hand, and at least it's responded very well, you know, positively on the economic side. And if you've got your uh, own views, please do, please do chip in. Um, I th I think we're we're um unless there are more questions. Um, I think we're going to we're going to wrap it up there. Thought of this has been a really interesting discussion. I'm very sorry that we've lost um, Kari Stevenson. We lost his sound um, early on during the and that last section of the interview, and I think he he may have lost hope there of um of being heard at the same time. And we've we've struggled to get back hold of him, and unfortunately we haven't been able to do it. So, but thank you very much indeed, Thought of for, for carrying us carrying us through the hour. It's very kind of you to stay with us for so long.